I am the peace inside you. You can call me Serenity, too. I live in the hearts of the righteous and the innocent. I'm known well by those who lift up love and lead a life of mercy and nonviolence. I am the peace inside Gandhi's heart. I am a feeling no hardship, trouble or wrong can erase. Gandhi knew full well one cannot reach the right destination by going down wrong paths. He knew full well that a just cause cannot be uplifted by violence, blood or war. And he struggled a lifetime for his cause. It was a peaceful struggle that kept its distance from fighting, raging and trespassing. He struggled by standing tall. His struggle was first and foremost with his inner self. He conquered the fury, the vengeance, the greed inside himself. Then he told his family, friends and people about his conquest. We will win through love and faith. I wanted to avoid violence. Non-violence is the first article of my faith. It is the last article of my faith. A people who give up on accepting justice as the highest law cannot make up for the disaster with any success. Bring down an unjust regime with justice. Go for the end call with clean hands. There is no path to peace. Peace is the path. We mustn't forget the marvellous work of our narrator tonight, Philip Hinton, beautiful voice, what doing a, a fabulous job, job for us. What a great job he's been doing tonight, absolutely fabulous. And another great performance, of course, the great Mahatma Gandhi, perhaps the world's most famous barefoot warrior, travelling around the world, spreading that message of non-violence, unity and peace. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to a new webinar episode in collaboration with Affinity in Dialogue Foundation and the Gandhi Experiment. I greet you from New Delhi, India, for tonight's webinar in recognition of the International Day of Nonviolence, a day which promotes global solidarity for building a peaceful and sustainable world. My name is Behzad Fatmi, and I'm the Secretary General of In Dialogue Foundation, New Delhi. We have just watched a short snippet from the International Festival of Language and Culture carried out in 2018 at the Sydney International Convention Center, organized 
by Affinity and Amity College. The IFLC is an annual celebration that embodies the diversity of linguistic talents from across the globe with the sole vision of uniting nations of the world through universal human values. As reflected in the performance tonight, we are gathered to honor one of the most extraordinary human beings in history. The International Day of Nonviolence is symbolically fixed on the anniversary of the birth of Mahatma Gandhi, the Indian freedom fighter and peace advocate who elaborated and applied the philosophy and strategy of nonviolence as early as 1906. The life and times of Gandhi have much to teach the contemporary world. A leader for Indian independence, for an end to racism and to the evils of the caste system, Gandhi gave a lifelong commitment to basic human rights. In pursuit of that goal, he summoned courage, displayed consummate organizational skills, and taught the enduring philosophy and practice of nonviolence. Without further, further ado, I would now like to introduce tonight's distinguished facilitator, Dr. Keith Sutter. Dr. Keith Sutter is the managing director of the Global Directions Think Tank. He is considered to be one of, one of Australia's most influential global futurists and media commentators in national and foreign affairs. He is an economic and social commentator, strategic planner, author, and broadcaster. Dr. Keith is also teaches political science on the Sydney International Campus of Boston University, USA. Additionally, he is the director of studies of the Australian branch of the International Law Association and NSW chair of the International Commission of Jurists. Dr. Keith has been a member of the international think tank, the Club of Rome, since 1993. Welcome, Dr. Keith. Thank you very much indeed. I greet you from the lands of the Eel people and um, I pay uh, tribute to their leaders, past, present and emerging, and thank them for their wise stewardship of the land on which we meet. Joining us this evening from India, is distinguished Mr. Tushar Gandhi, president and founder of the Mahatma Gandhi Foundation and great grandson of Mahatma. And from Melbourne is the distinguished Ms. Margaret Hepworth, who's the executive of Initiatives of Change Australia and founder of the Global Experiment. So I welcome both Tushar and Margaret to our conversation this evening. Let me begin by uh, a question to you, Tushar. Uh, Gandhi called his movement Satyagraha, Reliance on Truth, um, and they were broadly religious principles. Um, how relevant are Gandhi's principles today and how relevant are Gandhi's methods today? Um. Satyagraha really literally meant uh, truth force, but uh, the real meaning behind the word was the force of the soul. Because my great grandfather believed that uh, so the one soul never lied. One soul was always uh, linked to truth. And that is where even when he was in a dilemma, he used to always say that I was wa I'm waiting for the faint voice from of my soul to guide me because he believed that uh, one soul never would guide you astray and would always talk the truth. And he also believed that one soul, the voice of the soul was the greatest and most honest critic of oneself. And so Satyagraha was based on that uh, the morality of one soul and that is what made it invincible uh, whether he is relevant or not today depends on what we define relevance as maybe the man is no longer relevant because he was 70 years ago in our midst 
and he's no longer there world the world has changed from his time but what we need to remember is that he himself claimed not to have invented anything new he said that truth love peace and unity are as old as the mountains and the rivers i have not invented them i have just utilized them and evolved a methodology based on uh, the cornerstones of those qualities and so if you ask me the question is it relevant today my answer is is truth relevant today is love relevant today is peace relevant today is unity relevant today if the answer is no then he is not relevant but if the answer is yes then it doesn't only make him relevant but he it makes his ideology universal and eternal and not time bound so that would be my answer and and how about you margaret how do you feel on this Oh, thank you. Uh, well, I certainly echo what um, Tusha G has to say, and you know, delighted to be here. I want to begin by saying "Womanjeka." Uh, Womanjeka means welcome. Uh, we come with purpose because I'm speaking um, on the land of the Wurundjeri, um, the people of the Kulin Nation. And so, when you ask, you know, um, are Gandhi Gandhi G's methods and principles relevant today? I would agree that they are timeless. Um, they're as relevant as they ever have been. And I come from an education perspective. And in Australia, I would like to say they're particularly relevant um, for our Indigenous people, for our First Nations people. Um, and I'll speak more about that as we travel through the evening. But yes, um, so the principles of Ahimsa, of, um, of respect for all living things and, and an avoidance of non-violence. Now in um, the Wiradjuri people, they'll talk about Yindiyamara. Yindiyamara is respect for all living things. This is Aboriginal law, right? So it's extremely relevant. And if we look across the world globally, yes, we couldn't, um, we really couldn't be learning anything more principled um, Satyagraha, I teach my students, you know, to talk about, um, you know, your truth force um, or, your, you know, your soul force. And, and they learn about this. So this is Australian students. Um, and we ask the question, well, if my truth force, what I most deeply believe, right? But it's a, if it's different to yours, Dr. Keith, and we come at loggerheads over that, right? Well, what should we do about that? Well, we should step back to these principles of non-violence to find a way to connect and to find a way to sort out that conflict. So absolutely, yes, agree. Very, very relevant. And I would love to see these principles taught more in schools. One of the issues that's arisen with that movie, the wonderful movie made all those years ago on Gandhi by, uh, by Attenborough was the focus really on the negative side of, of Gandhi's um, principles. In other words, you know, how you uh, get the British Empire to change its policy in India, great achievement. But there was far less attention to the more positive side about building a better society. And, and today it seems as though so many of the issues that's confronting society seem to be of an economic nature. So are there still ideas that we can take from Gandhi in terms of how we can restructure a society to make it more, more equitable in economic terms. So starting off again with two shots. Uh, well, what I would uh, say over here uh, at this time is that, yes, in uh, uh, Attenborough's Gandhi was more biographical. And uh, so when you talked about the man's life, uh, the most dramatic uh, uh, incident of his life was the defiance of the empire and so his whole character was shown from the perspective of the freedom movement but as you said it was not just that he was also uh, at the same time while trying to fight for freedom he was also trying to find fight the societal uh, corruption the corruption of ethics in society 
and reform uh, Indian society at the same time. And that was equally important. And so that becomes very relevant. Where I'd just like to digress a bit and answer a question that uh, uh, Professor Hepworth uh, posed. Uh, what do you do when two opposing uh, truths collide? And I think the most important ingredient of nonviolence is the acceptance of difference. What Bapu said was that we are always going to be different. No two people are ever going to be identical in looks or in behavior or in belief. So unless we understand the difference, and from that understanding start respecting that difference and honoring that difference and then create a relationship based on that acceptance of our difference. Conflict is going to be unavoidable if you don't do that. And so the first ingredient of nonviolence is that we must accept and respect the differences and say, look, we are always going to be different, but Despite our differences, we are going to be living together in peace and harmony. Sustainability, I think the ancient uh, wisdom and civilization was the real uh, sustainable civilization and life, way of life. And the most unsustainable uh, uh, way of life is what we have come to be uh, known as civilization. You know, this whole thing about civilizing the savages was actually the savages uncivilizing the civilized people who knew how to live in harmony. And they went and taught those people to live in conflict eternally so that they could be called civilized. Because look, look what the civilized world did to the rest of the world. It introduced conflict, it introduced disharmony, it introduced unsustainability into centuries old uh, lifestyles that had lived in beautiful harmony with nature till then. And only when that false notion of civilization corrupted that ancient ideal, all the problems started. So I think that uh, unless we go back to the wisdom of the ancients, we are not going to be ever be able to evolve a sustainable lifestyle that can live in harmony with all the elements of life that we have so taken for granted in our ego of being civilized. So I think that is what we need to do and that is what nonviolence really tells us about because we have taken the simplistic a definition of nonviolence, meaning the absence of conflict and strife. But nonviolence is a way of life where you do not violate any other life form. Your life is so much uh, compacted around you, compressed around you, that you do not, by your existence, violate anybody else's right to exist. And that is true nonviolence, and that is the nonviolence that we must learn learn to practice. That is a very radical measure, isn't it? Of course, to try to do that. I wonder, Margaret, how you feel about the challenge that we would have in a modern consumer society like Australia, trying to live that type of life. <laughs> oh, look, it's a, it's fascinating, isn't it? Um, so much. I, I I'm going to come back to something uh, Tusha G just talked about um, learning from the, um, the knowledge of the ancients. And um, we have in Australia the oldest living, you know, culture um, on, on the planet. And unfortunately, um, white people came and used violence to suppress, to, you know, um, to really subjugate these people. And it's really only just now that there's, there seems to be a tide turning where people want to learn right so at initiatives of change at our center we're in, uh, instituting the first people's pathway um, learning center and this is for non-indigenous to learn indigenous wisdoms 
um, spirituality, intelligence, right? And this relates to economy, absolutely relates to economy. It's a very different way of, of seeing and understanding how we can exist together peacefully um, in, a, in an adjusted economic structure. There's so many people in Australia now, we, we tend to hear all the negative, like you said about the film, Dr. Keith, we tend to hear about the negative and, and not about the positive. When I ask my students, why is that? They will invariably refer to the media as bombarding us with negativity, right? But when we look towards the positive, there's so much positive, um, so many positive things happening in our world right now. And a lot of this is around the economy, right? A lot of this, uh, there are so many people wanting to live in community. They're wanting to um, run by uh, Gandhi's adage that the, that word enough, enough. I mean, that word says it all, right? I have enough. I don't need to extend beyond. I don't need to, you know, bring on this sort of greed mentality or this over competitiveness that sort of drives economies <laughs> into this um, exponential sort of dilemma, right? Um, yes, I think it's interesting because here, I, I only just the other day I was speaking to um, Patricia Garcia from the Institute of Economics and Peace. Now we don't always put those two words together, economics and peace, right? We often completely separate them. Uh, so I think your question is, is right. We do need to look at our economy and how that can contribute to peace, but we need to change the structures around it. But much more deeply than that, right, way more deeply than that, we need to change our attitudes. We need a, a mind shift in how we perceive the other. So when we talk about um, nonviolence, we, we usually sort of tend to go straight to the idea of physical violence. You know, we think about war, we think about physical conflict. But in actual fact, of course, there's a whole range of, you know, aspects of violence. So mental and emotional, um, social violence. To keep people in poverty is a form of economic violence. Right? So I'll say that to keep people in poverty is a form of economic violence. Um, climate change is a form of violence against the planet. So it's, it's quite remarkable when you, you know, listen to what Tusha G just said before, it's, uh, to take on non-violence as a way of life. You're actually addressing all of those issues. It's quite extraordinary. <laughs> and can I just uh, say a little bit before? Uh, I think we need to redefine economic uh, parameters. Our, uh, you know, our calculation of economy in itself is violent because economy survives, economic figures and growth figures survive on encouraging consumerism. And consumerism in its soul is violence because it only thrives on greed. It cannot thrive if everybody is satiated and says, I am satisfied, the economy will collapse. And so we need to redefine the, the formula of defining economics. And we have to evolve, evolve a non-violent formula of, uh, you know, judging economies of the world. Unless we do that, because to ask you a question, you, you said in a consumerist society, is it possible? Then the time has come to ask the question, how many more decades can we sustain this consumerist lifestyle? Can we? Yeah. You know, the time has yeah. come when that question becomes very important. Can we sustain the consumerist lifestyle that we have sort of adopted uh, so wholeheartedly? Mm. Mm. Dr. Sorry, can I just add? Sorry. I said I'm just Tushar. No Tushar Ji. Just Tushar. Okay. 
Oh, I like Tusha G. <laughs> um, look, interesting, um, when you speak to young people, they, they absolutely want change. They're looking for change. They're seeking change. They're prepared to stand up and, you know, argue for change. I speak to CEOs and they say the young people coming in to work for them actually look them square in the eye and demand change. Right? Um, when I ask students, it's an interesting question. We, 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 we teach global citizenship, right? And we get to a point in, in the workshops where I ask them, which has caused more damage to the world? Is it terrorism? Which undoubtedly, you know, that, that nobody's uh, <laughs> condoning terrorism. Which has caused more damage in the world? Terrorism or corporate greed? Now, without me feeding anything to these kids at all, I have never, ever, ever been in a workshop where the entire um, young audience doesn't reply corporate greed. Yeah. They know and they're looking for change. Tushar, I enjoy going to India, but I am intrigued by the way in which India is so set to become the global economic superpower by the middle of this century, certainly rivaling China and overtaking the United States. To what extent is Mahatma Gandhi's message of simplicity still being followed in his country 70 years after his death? Uh, Keith, unfortunately, today's India is the India of uh, Gandhi's worst nightmare come true. It has nothing to do with uh, the uh, dream that not only Gandhi but our founding, uh, uh, the founders of our nation had envisaged for the kind of nation that they had to create. We have prioritized all the non-essential uh, things. India today is, I'm sorry to use this kind of a term uh, for it, but obsessed with sucking up to the Western ideals and has abandoned the homegrown truth that we had adhered to for so long. And unfortunately, we succumbed. You know, we, we started believing that we were the savages who could only be civilized if we followed and aped the West. And we forgot that we attracted the West to us originally because of our civilization. And that is what is ailing India today. So everything that was, is wrong is today becoming central to the Indian existence. It is unfortunate. But today, if you ask me to give a comparison, I will compare today's India to be the India of Gandhi's murderer's dreams and not Gandhi's dreams. Yeah. And that because, also presumably he murdered, some of the, oh. because he murdered the person, but now yep. his ideals have been are being murdered. Yeah. And India is becoming a much more sectarian and embittered society, it seems to me, and becoming somewhat more anti-Islamic as well, and the risk of civil of this splits within the ethnic communities in India. Yes, we are not only uh, split on religious uh, grounds, we are divided on every thing that divides us, every notion that is divisive, we are divided on, whether it is religion, whether it is caste, whether it is sectarianism, whether it is gender, whether it is economy, every criteria that separates people is today a division within India and it's totally fragmentized. It's just that, you know, the national border on a map that is keeping us together. Otherwise, mm -hmm. there is no notion of unity existing in our society and politics is thriving on the divisions that they have so successfully created in my society. All the more necessary for the message of Gandhi to be understood at home then, obviously. 
yes we need to understand him and realize him much more than we need to preach him to the world and that's why you know recently on our prime minister's visit to the us uh, when uh, gandhi was referred over there everybody went gaga and said look gandhi is so important that even the president of the united states has to refer to him i said it doesn't matter to me it doesn't matter what matters is how we treat him back home how mm. we practice him back home that is important for me mm. yeah um and tusha is the... melbourne... yeah go on so i was going to say Margaret, down in melbourne you're you're obviously managing to develop quite a fan club for gandhi <laughs> in... <laughs> with your own organization well, <laughs> it it's interesting um I'm just listening to you know this, this so the Gandhi's practice of um you know inner listening and um and just stopping and uh you know meditating or praying or or whatever you want to call that or um at initiatives of change we call it quiet time and um and it is very acceptable in our um in our organization to take time during the day during your work day to go and find your own quiet place and just to stop for 10 minutes and have this quiet time and and the idea of quiet time is is that very gandian thing of of finding you know listening to um finding that inner peace um opening up to wisdoms and insights um connecting connecting in and that just as a practice it's such a simple practice it really does sort of shift how you respond through your work day or how you respond to your family um interesting in schools in australia now mindfulness is absolutely key you know it I have been in schools where year 9 students so these are 15 and 16 year olds I have seen 300 year olds rise to their feet and go into this silence and they're not they're not just mucking around they literally lose themselves for you know a few minutes and the effect of course we you know we know we don't have to the effect is very much what Gandhi said um that idea of if you can change yourself within the world around you will change and so you see this in practice now it's interesting because i've run the gandhi experiment across india um i've traveled oh across india i think five or six times and teaching global citizenship through the gandhi experiment and i've actually run meditations with um 300 indian teachers um and and to show i found it quite extraordinary when afterwards some of them came up and said to me can you teach us more meditation and i was like there's something really wrong here when i'm coming from australia <laughs> you know and you're asking me to do this should be the other way around surely but but essentially everything you're hearing me describe now i think it well it's certainly come from india i see it like that it's come from india now whether or not it's retained in india i i'm listening to you here in australia of course we've had it for over 60,000 years the practice of dediri which is deep listening it's it's really you know it's very similar right that gandian listening to the still small voice within dediri deep listening and being able to then feel into the person you're speaking to and relate to them on a very different level on a much deeper more personal level you're feeling into them not just you know what's going on up here or here so i absolutely agree i think this needs to be um resurrected then <laughs> i i i had a very uh, a curious uh, incident happened to me when uh, i talked about bapu's uh, listening to the inner voice and uh, i said you know we all have the inner voice within us and we can listen to it and that the classroom the students decided to test me out uh, to see if they could 
hear their <laughs> inner voice. And uh, one of them came back to me and said, "Look, I, I tried, and all I heard was my stomach growling. You know, I couldn't hear anything beyond that." And uh, now I said, "I need to give this person an answer. They, they, they want an answer." And I said, "Look." Your body will tell you what is the most critical need, and realize that if you just heard your stomach growling, the need of the stomach is far greater than what your soul is trying to tell you. So take care of your stomach, and then the voice of your soul will be amplified. <laughs> and that person was convinced by my answer. He said, "Yes, I agree with you." maybe there's something wrong with my stomach and so when i tried it talked to me and if i take yeah. care of that maybe my soul will am amplify the voice of my soul will amplify and speak to me so i think it also requires a little bit of clever ability to respond you know if i told the kid i said oh you know you're a glutton you're hopeless you can't do anything <laughs> That person would have never thought of listening, trying again. Yeah. But yeah. telling the person that uh, you know the need of the stomach is higher than the need of your soul, and so take care of it, and then your soul will speak to you. Was convinced. So we need to be that kind of a, kind of a little bit of a clever uh, person also. <laughs> to what extent, yeah. uh, to Shah? Um, are the teachings of Mahatma Gandhi now being made available in Indian schools? Are there classes explaining what he's about, etc.? Is... Unfortunately, not. Uh, we have cleverly confined Gandhi to the textbooks, and uh, the textbooks are so dreary that uh, the children really just don't want to delve deeper into the. textbook lessons and then go further beyond that having said that there are schools who teach non curriculum studies and encourage non curriculum studies they are doing much more to make gandhian ideology practical and practicable than the four curriculum schools are making it and so i see much greater value in the non curriculum education system that is slowly growing in india and i see a bright future for that and that is where the real education is being imparted yep can can i add i i work with um a group of indian educators um from initiatives of change india and they uh, have created something it's called education today society tomorrow and it is all values education and very much based on you know gandhian principles as applied to today um they run conferences and workshops um mostly from the center in panchgani but then they invite in principals and teachers and that work is then taken back out to the schools and of course one of the um you know the primary things they teach is change begins with me you know if uh, so the teachers come thinking oh we're going to learn all about you know something else out there and they they leave going i've learned so much about myself i've learned um you know what i need for change i learned i've learned what i need to change in a classroom to be more receptive to be more respectful of my students to create a different relationship i've learned what i need to be, you know to carry responsibility um it's pretty fascinating um you know curriculum so yeah i agree i'd love to see that um certainly love to see that spread more yeah to show you know the germans talk about goethe so we have these goethe institutes around the world is there something similar being organized in india to get gandhi's uh, views across as part of a government project or is it being left to the non government sector the the, the worthwhile uh, initiatives are all non government government does things which are just ritualistic and mechanism but the more worthwhile things are being done by the non government sector the voluntary sector uh, not also 
only the Gandhian sector. A lot of modern uh, initiatives, which are not named after Gandhi or, uh, you know, uh, are not really confined to the Gandhi space, but they are doing much more work in, uh, you know, propagating the ideals of Gandhi and making them practicable than the government and the Gandhian uh, Institute are themselves doing. And there are lots of examples of this in the field of activism, in the field of uh, practical education, the kind of education that Bapu talked about, you know, Barefoot College is a shining example of how they are empowering the poorest of the poor in society and making them self-reliant and self-confident. It's not just mm. self-reliance that is necessary, but the belief in one's ability, the confidence mm. that I can do it, I'm capable. Because poverty robs you of that, uh, that belief that I'm capable. You know, poverty makes you believe that you are not hopeless. You, you can't do anything. But, and to instill mm. the idea that, no, I am capable, I am able, in those people is half the battle won. So Barefoot College is doing that. There is an institution, small institution called Avni, which works with uh, children who are forced into the uh, labor market because of the poverty uh, of their families, rescuing them and equipping them with uh, education and skill to break out of the poverty trap. Those are the kind of initiatives that are doing much greater Gandhian work than government will ever do. Because finally, government has that myopic view of becoming populist. Everything they do has to become populist, has to convert into vote support at the end of their term. So their policies are only from election to election. Nothing beyond that. You know, if you give them, if you give them a program saying, 15 years down the line, you'll reap the benefits. They'll say, I'm going to go for re-election five years down the line. Who's going to wait for 15 years? Yeah. Give me yeah. something that yeah. works after five years, reaps benefits yeah. after five years. And so you yeah. can't expect them to really do something significant. To it's see, you spoke earlier. It's the law, law, law of profiteering. The political law of profiteering is garnering more votes. Yeah. Yes. I was just going to say you spoke earlier about um, you know um, the the knowledge of the ancients and how we need to you know bring bring that in, understand it more, apply it more. And when you talk about uh, politicians and a, you know, a four year term or a five year term and this very sort of short term vision, um, I remember hearing um, an uh, First Peoples Canadian uh, man speaking, and this applies here in Australia as well with our First Peoples, that when they make a decision, they, they look at how will this impact seven generations beyond us? How will the decision today impact seven generations beyond us? These are the things we need to be bringing in to our political arena, aren't they? Yeah, yeah absolutely, absolutely. Tushar, how does the um, uh, Gandhian movement stand worldwide? Obviously, the American president knows about it, but um, how about elsewhere in, in Western Europe or the Americas or, or Africa, particularly South Africa? What is the global standing of the Gandhian movement? See, I, I think uh, wherever there is a, a, a fight for right against might, the Gandhian movement or the Gandhian inspiration even comes in indirectly, even when there is no direct association, indirectly it comes in. And I think the Black Lives Matters uh, movement that uh, uh, happened in the US and the Western world uh, just towards the end of Trump's uh, term was Gandhian in nature because majoritarily it was nonviolent. It was passive resistance as practiced by Martin Luther King. And if you acknowledge Dr. King, 
then you have to acknowledge the inspiration that uh, Martin Luther King acknowledged himself. And so it does, didn't just stop with Dr. King, but it has come to our times also in the Black Life Matter, uh, Lives Matter movement. If you look at the Arab Spring in Egypt and then in the uh, Emirates when it happened, the first protesters walked into the protest sites carrying posters of Gandhi and quotes of Gandhi because in their belief of their system responding violently, they were insulating themselves by the image and ideal of Gandhi and that was giving them strength. And I believe that everywhere, wherever this, uh, these uh, movements are on, look at South Africa. Just two months back, it was uh, ravaged by sectarian violence. And it almost felt as if it was the beginning of civil war in South Africa. But they have been able to heal the wounds by invoking Gandhi and Mandela. And today, the initiative to normalize society again is spearheaded by the ideology of Gandhi and Mandela over there. So everywhere where you see this strife happening, in some way or the other, a resolution is happening through the Gandhian way. Even where protests happen in my country for the past one year, farmers are on the war path. But for one year, all the violent incidents are engineered by the government. And the farmers have been steadfastly nonviolent in their protests. Mm. And if that is not Gandhi, then who is it? Yeah. You know, you don't have to wear the label on your forehead saying, I'm Gandhi. <laughs> your actions prove that. And I, I keep seeing this in many, many uh, you know, uh, f fights for uh, for the rights in all over the world, in different cultures, in different places. Even the very, very subtle fight for the rights and recognitions of the original people, the ancients, they have the virtue of patience, yeah. which for them is centuries old, millenniums old. But its modern day practice is linked with Gandhi. And so, you know, you, these, are the, these are the symptoms of hope that we get. Yep. And I believe that that is what the true uh, Gandhi is all about. The person is no longer important. The individual is no longer important. It is the ideal that has to be cherished. And the time has come to ask the question. I don't care whether Gandhi is relevant anymore or not. But what, the ideals that he uh, stood for, do they matter to us or not? If they don't matter to us, then they are useless. You know, we can discard them. We don't need them. We've discarded many things in our journey of life so far. So many civilizations have arisen and been destroyed and life has gone on. But does it matter to us or not is the pertinent question. Yeah. Yeah, very true. Yeah. Margaret, for your organization is also international. What, how do you view the international scene in terms of the Gandhian movement and uh, the interest of the Gandhian principles? Yeah, uh, it's it's interesting um, how often Gandhian foundations or organisations across the world will will reach out to me. Um, so it's it's through that that I know that there is this incredible sort of global interconnectedness in actual fact. Um, we again, you know, as I said earlier, we we hear a lot about the violence that is occurring in our world, but we don't often hear um, the opposite. You know, the people that are actually attempting to, to, to stem the tide of violence or, and how they go about doing that. Um, at the moment, 
um, in Australia. You know, we are having um, oh protests, the anti-vax movement, the um, the anti-lockdown, um, and and you look at that and again there are people out there protesting in a non-violent way there are people protesting in a in a very violent way but in actual fact what that has stirred up in melbourne is a call for non-violence it makes people speak more loudly um saying yes you have freedom of speech we live in this you know pretty amazing country where you can protest but find your way to protest that is not destructive or harmful. Um, I find that really interesting. So uh, I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> Tushar, to what extent um, do, do the Gandhian ideas promote dialogue and engagement amongst different faiths, um, especially in a pluralistic society? I don't think the Gandhian ideals will uh, survive without dialogue. They are based and built on uh, the ideal of dialogue, of communication. That's where, you know, in the first place, I started off with saying that we are always going to be different. And we have to mm -hmm. learn why we are different and we have to accept that difference and then respect that difference. And that evolution can only happen if there is a continuing dialogue because the only thing that silence breeds is intolerance and hatred because you bottle up everything within you you do not communicate it's healthy to tell somebody that you don't like what they are doing rather than bottle it up within yourself and say you know one fine day i'll teach you a lesson because when that one fine day comes, you end up doing something that you would not have ever done in your normal course of actions. And so if Gandhian ideals are to succeed, they can only succeed if a continuous healthy dialogue is, uh, is an ongoing natural thing. Because silence breeds contempt and contempt breeds hate and prejudice and those are the antithesis of gandhian ideology thank you margaret you want to add anything to that yes yes um we actually teach um our students that uh, conflict and anger are natural and normal right natural normal part of life it is your behavior your subsequent behavior that counts so how you carry out that anger you know, it, it becomes a choice, right? Um, it's, you know, your responsibility, your choice about the way you speak with or relate to other people is incredibly important, but it is a choice. Um, we have a really, really interesting um, activity with, it's quite extraordinary, it's very simple. It's to ask um, young people and, and adults alike this question, um, how would you stop a terrorist organization using nonviolence. And they go off into their breakout rooms and they discuss this at extraordinary length and they come back. And I can tell you, I have seen teenagers come back with very realistic, doable, you know, how do you stop a violent group through nonviolence? Um, I had a 16 year old boy say to me once, you ask your enemy, what is your truth? Now think about that in relation to what you've just been talking about. Um, be prepared to listen. We're, we're currently running um, national forums on truth telling and truth hearing. So our indigenous people will say, we've been telling you the truth for decades, you, do, you don't listen. So now we're teaching truth hearing the ability to listen to understand to to you know open yourself up to hearing something and then ask yourself well now that i know this what's my role in this if you come back to that activity about um you know stopping a terrorist organization through nonviolence, we then bring it closer to home and we say well if you've figured that out 
How do you stop domestic violence in a family through nonviolence? How do you stop the bully in the playground using nonviolence? And we really stretched their thinking in a, in a sort of highly creative way to things that become applicable, doable, achievable. Hmm. Uh, I Can also take... think that, oh, sorry, I'll just take a minute. Oh, no, I also think that for too long, we have stress on conflict resolution. But we have failed to understand that when we talk or teach conflict resolution in an indirect way, we are saying wait for conflict to happen and then start working towards resolving that conflict. <laughs> but the true nonviolent uh, thing to do is to recognize the symptoms of future conflict and start working mm. to mitigate the, the, the uh, symptoms and to avoid the conflict mm. in, uh, in its entirety from happening. Mm. We need to now start teaching, if we truly believe in peace and nonviolence, we need to start teaching conflict avoidance, not conflict resolution. Mm. Mm -hmm. And that mm. is the most important thing to do. Mm. Yeah, That's a, a very good note on which to end, Tushar. So thank you. Tusha and Margaret for that fascinating and insightful conversation. And I'd now like to call upon Emeritus Professor Stuart Rees AM, the founder of the Sydney Peace Foundation to provide some closing remarks. Over to you, Stuart. Look what, um, thank you Tusha and, uh, and Margaret and, and Keith, because what you've been addressing is absolutely relevant to the um, state that the world is in. And I have a sense of urgency if, if, the, um, if the United Nations is correct about the consequences of, um, of global warming, uh, the catastrophes could, may end in 10 or 12 years. In other words, the, what, what we're talking about has an enormous sense of urgency about it. And in that respect, I mean, I'm reminded that, uh, that Gandhi also was a pretty shrewd politician. He had a certain what I would call street wisdom about him. He wasn't only the, um, the philosopher and practitioner, well, he was a philosopher and practitioner of nonviolence, but he had this, um, this street wisdom, this political kind of savoir faire. Uh, the other things, the, the other crucial issues that you've uh, talked about or referred to concern the um, concern the, the gap between the rich and the poor. You can see it now in the, in the current moment in the apartheid system operating with the availability of vaccines, where the rich world is, um, is having boosters, um, whereas many of the people in the continent like Africa haven't received one, 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 one uh, boost. And Margaret absolutely correctly reminded us of the other pandemic that's going on around the world. It's been going on for decades. It's called domestic violence. Mm. And I thought Tushar would have mentioned, for example, the appalling violence of the caste system in, in, um, in India, which um, it has to be a sort of um, political cancer in itself. Uh, nevertheless, I'm enormously grateful for this, for the affinity having put on this seminar. What each of the three of you have said, and Keith characteristically, is an old navigator friend of mine. He navigates his way through all sorts of, all sorts of conflict, asking, asking the right questions across, across continents. Um, I mean, you're as good at this now, Keith, as you were 30 years ago when you were almost, almost a young man. Um, thank you. Look, thank you for the references to Gandhi. Thank you for the references to <laughs> Martin Luther King and to Nelson Mandela. <clears throat> we need we need their ideals. We need their way of thinking because a sense of urgency about it. We're actually talking about an end to. I mean, Trisha, you've mentioned it without using the word capitalism. You've talked about greed. You've talked about the absurd the absurd preoccupation with competition to accumulate more and more but it's about it's about the uh, the simple formula that the, that the finance houses around the world give us that you have to um, 
accumulate as much as possible. You have to, mm. there's no alternative to economic growth. And your wonderful example of the protest of the farmers of India is, is, uh, is a reminder of what the, um, the way of living and the way of agriculture and the way of survival that is an alternative to that. So um, thank you, Affinity, for putting it on. Uh, Ahmed Polat is the always the man behind the scenes. Um, and I want to, Kim, I want to acknowledge the indispensable language, philosophy and practice of Gandhi, but along with um, the Muslim scholar and leader Fatullah Gulen, um, the memory of um, a very good colleague of mine whom I spent a fair bit of time with, with a very unusual name, uh, Nelson Mandela. And consistent with that, I'm asked to um, invite members of the audience to, to join on October the 10th, um, uh, another webinar consistent with the values and the language that the three of you have been talking about tonight. It's called Women Leaders in the Abrahamic Tradition Role uh, role models, role models for our time. And there's um, somebody with technological skills. It may be Matthew far better than mine. Has just put the the name, the the pictures of the contributors onto the screen. So look, um, thank you uh, again, Tusha, Margaret, and Keith. Um, I valued enormously, and I'm sure the audience have uh, the questions, the answers, and the the ideas which I just simply go away with a sense of urgency about the need to apply them. Uh, thank you and um, good night.